What up? Seth Miranda here. This is Adorama Rewind, and it is a jam-packed week. 10 tons of gear releases, lenses, bodies, all sorts of stuff like that. And I tried to condense it by brand so that we're not going through a thousand articles. Uh, but there is also some cool stuff that's not gear related or kind of gear related, but it's just like cool stuff in general like this. Uh, vintage cameras were sliced up and frozen in resin. Yeah, so this artist does this to a lot of things. They're like exploded views of uh, different items and he did a series with uh, vintage cameras. And even his website is just bananas on some next level stuff with Lamborghinis being exploded and all sorts of stuff that's photo related. But I think it's really cool to see some stuff in a new way that's been around forever, right? So uh, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but forever ago, when I was a kid, there was something called the Virtual Man, and they actually took a prisoner's cadaver, put them in gelatin and sliced them within thousands of an inch, and then scanned all those so we had an anatomical map, three-dimensional rendering of uh, the human body. And I just kept thinking about it with this. I mean, this is just, awesome you know and then people are going to be like no but those cameras they'll never exist i guarantee you that there's 10 tons of cameras out there just sitting on piles that are just broken or display only i mean we definitely have some in the used department here and while they're nostalgic and historical having them just sit and collect dust doesn't really help anybody at least this gets a lot of new fresh eyes on old style cameras and maybe this will inspire some developers out there or um, brands or people that design cameras in the future to kind of take some hints and notes of what we used to have with those all metal bodies and the real stylistic things we used to see. Uh, go check that out. The artist's name is uh, Fabian, let me show you, Fabian Offner. this is his last name, Fabian Offner. So just want to give him a shout. That was pretty awesome. Uh, good looks. So let's get into some gear. So Nikon has unveiled a 3D LUT for N-Log video and apparently they're going to charge for ProRes RAW update. Yeah, so the N-Log needed something that was close to Rec. 709 so that you could actually have a color space to work with to make editing faster. And they've been talking about ProRes RAW going out to an Atomos recorder of uh, the 10-bit color video. We we're waiting the 12-bit ProRes RAW for the Z6 and Z7, and apparently it's gonna cost some money. So they're saying that it's not just about a firmware, that they actually need to do some hardware additions to your camera. So if you own a Z series, they're saying that there will be a service charge. You don't have to take it into a Nikon facility to get that taken care of if you want the, um, the ProRes RAW update, which is kind of upsetting, right? We thought that it was just gonna be a firmware that we download and we can unlock this camera to another level, but it turns out that there's uh, something that's missing as an additional internal upgrade, they're calling it. Uh, hit up the link below if you're someone that's shooting video with these cameras and wanted that and just check out what it takes. I, there's no uh, say on how much it'll cost exactly, and I'm wondering if uh, they might reconsider this and just make it like something they take care of on the fly. I don't know, you never know, but there's definitely some camera companies that charge you for using log in their cameras like Panasonic. And speaking of Panasonic, they just had a monster release with a new way of thinking, the new S1H mirrorless, and a bunch of lenses came out too. Well, not a bunch, but a couple. So the S1H is really a special camera. They have the S series already. Let's talk about this. So the S1H is in succession to the S1 and the S1R, which is Lumix's first throw at a mirrorless full frame system. It has the L mount, which is Sigma, Leica, and them, which is basically the SL mount from Leica. Uh, what is so special about this? It's really geared for video. So let's talk about some features. The S1, the S1R were Lumix's first throw at the full frame mirrorless market. The S1H is really them going into the cinema world. Yeah, so it's not just a video camera, it's not a hybrid mirrorless. $4,000 for the body, sure, but 24.2 megapixel full MOS sensor is basically the sensor that's in the S1. It's 6K, 24P, 3.2, and 4K, 4.3 video recording. Big deal there, dual native ISO, and I mean real dual native ISO, not just simulated, not electronic, but an actual circuit board, V-Log, V-Gamut, uh, 14 stops dynamic range, you know, waveform monitor, vector scope, zebra stripes, all sorts of stuff, and it's L-mount compatible, right? So you can use the uh, SL Leica lenses, the Sigma lenses that are coming out, the native lenses that come for it. Uh, Nick Dabis, who we uh, teamed up with to create a video with it, actually had a PL mount adapter on it so he could put 
cook lenses and, and like all sorts of lenses on this thing, uh, full cinema lenses. It's a really interesting body. It's uh, totally uh, overbuilt, right? It's dust splash resistant, freeze resistant. It can take a hit, fully articulating screen, multiple uh, recording buttons on it. So if you have it caged up and on rails, you can, you'll be able to hit record somewhere on this. Like they, it's not gonna be hard to use. They really thought about who's gonna be using this camera. And actually right over here, boom, 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 right there is an SDI port to have time code, which is insane. You could sync this up with actual legit cinema equipment. It's really a Varicam in, in your palm, in your hands right there, which is incredible. Um, I was skeptical going into this. I was like, what is this thing? And then when we were on set with Nick, uh, I really saw what this thing could do and, and the capabilities it had. So I really think this camera is for somebody that has uh, a mirrorless system now that wants to step up to cinema, but maybe doesn't want to spend like six, eight, ten grand. Uh, maybe it's somebody that you know, is really getting serious about video, but doesn't think the mirrorless systems that are out there now are really holding up to what they want to get up to. And that's what this can do. Or maybe if you're a director that wants to film quick proofs of concept, you have something to do with that's at a level that could show what you're really envisioning rather than just kind of giving like a, a different quality version of what you could produce, right? So we created this video with uh, Nick, and if you notice here, right there, very handsome gaffer right there. Incredible, this guy totally made the entire film, clear, clearly, clearly. But Nick takes you through what he did with it. Um, we made a 60 second film and the footage was amazing. The guy went above and beyond working on forklifts to make uh, to make a, a crane shot happen and all sorts of stuff. I mean, this guy is as real as it gets, legit. And you can actually see like the rigs that he put together for this thing. He really built this thing out. And uh, the short film looks great. I mean, the low light capability on this camera was phenomenal due to the, you know, the, um, the dual native ISO and stuff like that. So do yourself a favor, hit the link, read up about it. If you're someone that's serious about getting to video, serious about cinema, this might be for you, um, if at the very least, if you're thinking about it, rent it and check it out, because I was very impressed with it, and I don't want to spend the whole you know, episode on this, but uh, it, was, it was pretty interesting. Uh, the other thing is that Panasonic revealed a 24 to 70 2.8 L mount and a 25 millimeter 1.4 from Micro Four Thirds. So they really needed this 24 to 70 uh, in their lineup for sure. Uh, the other options were adaptable lenses from other brands, and now you have it. We did do a video on our channel with Rob Adams, do a hands-on preview of it, so you can check that out. I'll put that link down there below as well. So Panasonic, man, they're coming out of the gate hard, and they mean they really mean business and. Um, I think they've been the sleeping dog in this race and now people are starting to really realize maybe there's something going on over there. Uh, the cameras are maybe a little bit bigger, it may be a little bit more pricier, but their performance is insane. And the fact that they're thinking about these areas that other people aren't really in, like this handheld cinema world, uh, very impressive. And they have been releasing a lot of short films showing the capability of the S1H. I'm talking a lot about it because I was so impressed with it. I have to, I just, I was really taken back by their methodology and their execution. So check that out. Canon also had a bunch of releases and I actually got to try some of it out. So Canon released the, uh, or announced rather, EOS 90D and the M6 Mark II, which are APS-C cameras. And they also kind of sort of announced the release of the RF uh, series Trinity lenses. So yeah, the 15 to 35, the 24 to 70, and they also have the 7200 all 2.8 Trinity lenses coming out. Uh, you can see my video here where I tried this out. So the 90D is an optical viewfinder. The M6 Mark II is mirrorless, but it also has a detachable, I don't know if you can see it right there. Let me see if I can show you here. This is a detachable EVF if you wanted it. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool, 14 frames per second, 10 frames per second on the 90D. And they actually uh, spent a bunch of time on the 90D in the optical viewfinder to be better at facial recognition, which is interesting for an optical. And if you want to check it out, I shot uh, here with the, um, with the camera, did some video with it, and you can see uh, some of my shots here. Uh, some pretty great stuff uh, with Emily. Just trying it out in low light situations on a gloomy day and just natural light and some strobe work and stuff like that. So check that out. The Canon lenses, we have a video with Vanessa Joy uh, trying out the 15 to 35, the, uh, what was the other one? I'm like losing uh, this 24 to 70 and she actually shows the 70 to 200 2.8, which is the three lenses that pretty much every system tries to put out so you can get through any job. Uh, and it, it's, it's great that Canon has a great lens line and we're still kind of looking where they're going with the R series, uh, but it shows they're thinking about it. And on top of all that, they announced that they have a, 
update coming soon to their autofocus. So yeah, they showed that the eye autofocus they're saying is pretty much up there with uh, what they're saying is Sony grabs the eye from farther away. And as she moves close, you can see that sticking pretty closely. And this is where it was before. And here's where it is now. Um, better recognition, uh, better tracking. And this also, it shows moving subjects that are coming in from out of nowhere. Once they come into frame, it grabs them and stays with them. So huge, huge upgrade to the R systems autofocus system, the R series autofocus system. We'll say it like that. Uh, so if you did get into that system, uh, keep watch for that firmware update. And if you're looking for native lenses, they're pumping them out. They're getting them out there for you. Sony, however, came out with their APS-C uh, lineup, new A6600 and the A6100, and the new 16 to 55 millimeter F2.8 G and the 70 to 350 millimeter F4.5 6.3 G OSS lenses. So what is all of this? Well, it's the new APS-C in the A6000 series. They recently had the 6400, and now they have the 6600 and the 6100. Blah, 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 all sixes, right? Tons of sixes. The 6600 is $1,400, as you can see here, and it's a bit of a powerhouse. It's 24 megapixels, uh, it does have the five axis stabilization, it has 4K, uh, it has the, the sticky autofocus and all that crazy stuff. But the real thing I think that people uh, are psyched about is that it takes the Z battery, which is a bigger battery, allowing for a bigger grip, which is better ergonomics, which Sony has had a little bit of a weak point on, right? I mean, uh, now they have these little cameras, uh, the A6000 series that uh, has a pretty good grip and better battery life. And the lenses are pretty cool because as an APS-C camera to have 350 millimeters, that's like over 500 millimeters equivalent in 35 millimeter frames or full frame. Is that a little bit confusing? So what I'm saying is, is that since it's a crop sensor, a 350 millimeter lens, if it was the equivalency on a full frame, it would be over 500 millimeters. So that's a lot of zoom for you people out there that are in this series. Uh, pretty exciting. And I think this is a great series for people who are getting into filmmaking that don't want to spend a lot of money, want a lot of features, small, can go on a, a, a real easy gimbal setup. Uh, the A6000 series has been like that series for the beginner filmmaker, I think. Um, check it out. Uh, releases non-stop, right? Insta360, whoa, yeah, so they dropped the smallest stabilized camera. They've been known for dropping some weird stuff, but this is a, a kind of a zigzag into a new direction for them. So this is really how big it is, and it's magnetic. So if you check it out here, what they're basically saying is it's a hands-free first-person view um, that allows you to just be a vlogger and not worry about it. Just put it on yourself or put it onto some sort of apparatus and it's stabilized. It won't look choppy or banged up. Um, they're not really going after the GoPro or the DJI market per se. It is a pretty affordable camera and it gives you this like set it and forget it mentality of just wearing it on yourself and not needing a ton of gear and things like that. So check that out if you're somebody that's into vlogging or um, just, you know, out and going on vacation, just want to put something on yourself and record what's going around you and chop it up later. It's pretty interesting for that. And being magnetic is kind of interesting too. They have like a necklace that you wear under your clothes and then this connects to the magnet. So that's kind of interesting. Um, if speaking of the small iPhone-y type stuff, new mic just hit the market, which is pretty cool. You've seen uh, us go live using the Rode Go Wireless. I've used it on my own Instagram nonstop. Uh, the IGTV for Adorama, every host is using the Rode Go Wireless. This seems to be another iteration from Sarmonic. Sarmonic, Sarmonic, however you say it, unveils the Blink 500 Ultra Compact 2.4 gigahertz wireless clip on mic system with labs. So here's what's interesting about it. This right here is what's interesting. With the Rode Go Wireless, you need a, a patch cable to actually get to the phone. Here, it seems to be powered off of the phone's lightning port and you have a clip-on mic. Pretty convenient, right? Might not be what people want to have their battery drained out of their phone to power this, but we don't know what the power consumption is on it to begin with. It's a clip-on mic just like the Go, but it can also take an external mic just like the Go. And we're looking at, uh, you know, right out of the box pairing, all that type of stuff, super compact, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. But here it is, right? It's USB-C or it can be lightning adapted 
for the receiver, which is interesting, right? So instead of needing cables or trying to find a place to clip something or have a separate uh, body that has to be mounted on something, it just goes right into the phone. That's kind of the interesting part of this to me. Let me know if that's something that interests you. I know there's a lot of people that are using mics for their iPhones now, and we've been big uh, fans of the Rode Smart Lav and uh, the Rode Go, and here comes another one. So I'm wondering if there's more you know, audio companies that are realizing this and putting some research development into systems. So let me know if that's something that interests you. Uh, we've talked about Flickr in the past on this show and people were just like, Flickr's dead, rah, or the pro accounts that they want to charge you money for if you have over a thousand images. Well, guess what? Uh, you can now do prints through it. Flickr was bought by SmugMug last year and now they have right here a printing tab. So they teamed up with companies like Bay Photo so that you can go right from your album to a print high quality and you know have a real life print of your work, which is kind of cool. Something new added on. Uh, this might be something that people really want. This might be something that might take people away from having just an account on a printing service. And now they have an album that's live for people to see their images as well as get a print. Will this help Flickr out? I don't know. Uh, it seems a lot of people have walked away from Flickr over time. Uh, this could be a nice little add-on selling point, especially for people that are looking for new places to house their work and also uh, take their images to another place or level, you know, not bad. Uh, I also want to break this all this gear stuff up with uh, this one. A woman falls from a sixth floor balcony while posing for extreme yoga photos. Yeah, so this went pretty vir viral with this image. Uh, she hit the floor and it's going to take her a few years of uh, rehabilitation. Um, this poor woman, I, I know it was stupid for her to do it. She went through 11 hours of surgery, years of recovery is, and at least going to be three years before she can walk, but she's lucky to be alive, honestly. And this is what we're getting to, right? Is that what can people find to put on their Instagram, which is worth people staying tuned into them. And this is what is happening, right? We saw a poisonous octopus get stuck to one woman's face. We've seen uh, uh, an endless Instagrammers fall off cliffs and all sorts of stuff, get attacked by wild animals. I don't know, is it, is it worth the risk of your life, your well-being to get an Instagram photo up there? I'm sure in her head, she's probably like, I do this all the time or I could handle this there's always an X factor of anything going wrong. You know, your hands are just that extra slippier that morning and you hit the floor. I don't know, this is insane. Uh, because we talked about last week about that influencer that may have faked a bike accident. This really happened and at least the actual accident wasn't up there on social, uh, kind of crazy. And I just wanted to bring this one up. Hubble telescope has released some photos of Jupiter. Look at how gorgeous this is. Let me make this a little smaller so we can see it a little better. Oh man, look at that, unbelievable. Makes you just feel like super small, right? It's just amazing what's out there in this world. Of course, some flat earths are gonna tell me that this is CGI, not real, but whatever, I don't care. Uh, NASA released this uh, June 27th on 2019 is when they shot it and they published it. Uh, check it out, I will put the links and the NASA links down below. And um, I just really get psyched on astrophotography. It's an area that I'm not totally familiar with hands-on, but I really get like, wow, I just love that kind of stuff. Uh, and I'm just gonna wrap the actual news up with this one. Fablographer is asking the question, will adding IBIS cameras really help Canon? And I think this is a discussion worth having because that's kind of one of the critiques on the uh, R series is that they don't have internal body stabilization in the body, but they have some really great stabilization in their lenses. But as far as people are concerned, IBIS sells, right? Having that five stops of stabilization inside the camera body means any lens becomes stabilized if you think about it. Uh, I don't know, and now they also have released R lenses that don't have stabilization in them, but they all seem to be going forward with IS in them. So I think it's worth talking about, right? Let me know what you think about that. Is it enough to be stabilized in the glass or do you really want that uh, IBIS in body. I, I'm, I'm pretty uh, curious about what people think about out there. Are you someone that's in the Canon system that's been waiting for IBIS? Is it not enough for you to have it in the glass? Uh, I've seen Vanessa Joy use the stabilized lenses and I've been impressed with the, uh, the level of stops that she's been able to expand upon uh, going slower and she even shows it in the uh, the Trinity lens release video thing. I'll put the link below obviously. Uh, it's pretty pretty um, it's a pretty good topic to talk about. And, you know, Canon is just trusting their technology as far as being in the, in the lens. So you have to be, you have to commend that to some degree, right? 
All right, that's where I'm going to leave all the news, but I wanted to bring up a comment from last week. Uh, we talked about that Instagrammer that I just mentioned getting into a motorcycle accident. I don't know if, it, if it, she did or not. I'm not, I'm not saying whether that's got truth or validity to it, but it is something that was out there and debated about. And I got this comment from Life and Death. Get it? Life and Death. Get it? I thought Adderon was about camera gear. So who curated the 10 minutes of PR for some broad on IG? That doesn't belong here. Uh, got news for you. One, women aren't broads, and that just shows the level of respect you have for women out there. So if you are a photographer, I hope you treat models a little better than that. I'm going to not expand on that too much, but yeah, come on. And uh, it also shows the level of class you have. But that doesn't belong here. It absolutely belongs here. We need to see what is happening out there with the gear we're using to create content. That being said, I just showed you a mic that was developed for iPhones because there's a market for it. If this woman is an influencer and she's expanding the idea of people using things to create content to publish themselves, then yeah, it affects the gear. And we're gonna see things like Wi-Fi enabled cameras that get photos into your phone and apps that go into your lighting and all sorts of stuff that's all about catering to people like that. So this absolutely belongs there. So I completely disagree with you thinking that just because she's an Instagrammer and uh, you thought that Adderam was about camera gear that this doesn't, this isn't pertinent, right? It absolutely is. The people using the gear is as important as the gear. This industry listens to what's going on out there. They're trying to find the market that'll keep things alive and they just wanna see what the majority is. I mean, we're seeing companies like Profoto make more and more user-friendly, um, consumer-friendly, uh, you know, hobbyist-type gear away from the pro market, right? We're seeing that happen. We're seeing uh, triggers for lighting that have no buttons on them, make them easier to use because it's less intimidating. We're, we're seeing people uh, out there using their phones at levels that they probably never thought to before. We're seeing people have bigger audiences that were never trained in how to create content or shoot or light or record audio the more than ever before, right? So of course, of course, this is a topic I want to talk about. And apparently it's a topic a lot of you want to talk about after I looked at the comments. I'm sorry that I didn't get around to physically answering them, but uh, it, it got a little crazy. As you can see with all the gear releases, I had to go do videos to test some stuff out and uh, record stuff for you guys. So, uh, and, and we appreciate every view we get and every like that we get and every comment that we get and every share that we get because that's what keeps this channel alive and the bigger things get the more resources we uh, enable ourselves to have to bring you higher level content like the nick davis video that was in the s uh, to use the s1h please check the video out by the way it's only 60 seconds and it feels like a micro cinematic film it's amazing uh all right i'm gonna leave you guys there uh question of the week after all this, do you guys feel oversaturated with gear? Is it just too much? Are there just too many releases? Do you feel that if a camera company or whatever company releases too many models in succession, too, too close together, that it's hard for you to trust into buying that piece of gear? I'm curious about that because a company like Sony has dropped the RX 106 and 7 in like the same year. That's crazy, right? Or the A6000 series seems pretty crowded a little bit. Do you get weary of buying the next one? Are we having iPhone syndrome where they're like, nah, I'm good enough. I'll wait for two more generations before I upgrade or buy it. Really curious about that. But I just want to cap this all off with saying whatever you have, just shoot with it. Okay, don't get discouraged by all this. Don't dis get discouraged about price tags. Whatever you have, document, create, shoot, go do it. I'm gonna leave you guys there. Thank you guys. I said it like four times, right? Man, this was a blah, blah, blah type of week. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we're almost at a million subscribers and that's because of you. And uh, I can't think enough personally. I'm gonna say it like every week until we get to a million. So if you don't wanna keep hearing this, get us to a million, share this channel around. See you next time, peace. <laughs>